All right, welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of Education in Color. Today I am joined by the illustrious Frank Wu, President of Queens College. Frank, take it away with the introductions. Great to be here with you. It's just wonderful to be a New Yorker now and to be in the world's borough, Queens. I'm about to start my fourth year as President of Queens College. I, I can't believe it. Uh, it's uh, just been, it's been great so far. Man, that's crazy. Four years. But, you know, as I was walking around the campus filming the B-roll, I'm just like, wow, it looks super nice. So, you know, I'm pretty sure the four years went to like really, really good beautification and all that other good stuff. But moving to our first question, I want to ask you, what was your educational experience like growing up? And what was your relationship with education and school in general? You know, I say to our students, my family is just like your family. My parents came to the U.S. in the early 1960s. I was born here. I'll be 56 this year. So my parents came as scholarship students. I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for American higher education. So I've sort of come full circle. So my parents came because they believed. They believed in that proverbial American dream. You know, it beckoned with hope and opportunity the world over. And my parents knew that their lives would be improved if they came here specifically as students. You know, my father was telling me he grew up in Taiwan, and uh, he's still alive. He'll be 87 this year. He was telling me when he was a kid, so after World War II, they weren't vegetarians. They ate meat, but you would have this much meat at mm. a meal. like meat as a as a condiment as a right. seasoning and that actually is true in many parts of the world where people eat meat they just they can't afford much of it mm-hmm. then he came to the US and he realized even if you're not a rich person you can get a steak mm-hmm. an 8 ounce steak that's as much meat as a family of 4 would eat for a month And here in the United States, one person would sit down at a meal. Not someone who's royalty, not someone who's the richest person in the nation, just a normal person. Now, you can do it every day, but you could go out and get an eight-ounce steak. And so for him, that that symbolized the bounty of this nation, right, that that you could go to a— a chain steakhouse, or you could go to the supermarket and there would be steak there, right? They didn't run out like they did when he was a kid growing up. So for my parents to be able to come here was something that they they wished for, they hoped for, because when they were young, and this is something else that's true the whole world over, even now, probably more so now, they watched Hollywood movies. So as teenagers, they knew, well, they knew a picture of America that came from Hollywood, that came from these movies, and they aspired to cross the Pacific Ocean to to come here. So they did. My father earned a PhD, my mother earned a master's, and then they put down new roots, and they became Americans over time. So for my family, higher education has always been the key. It's, it's what my parents emphasized, that you have to apply yourself in school. You, you asked about what it was like for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew up in the American Midwest, I grew up in Detroit in the 1970s, the Motor City. And I'll be honest with you, I'm glad to be in New York City, in Queens, in the 2020s. I'll explain why. You know, back then, nobody talked about diversity. Mm-hmm. That just wasn't a phrase anyone used, right? right? You, if you had said diversity, equity, and inclusion 50 years ago, people would have said, huh? What? <laughs> because you were supposed to assimilate. You're supposed to fit in. You're supposed right. to be just like your neighbors, right? Eat the same food. Wear the same clothes, right? Have the same beliefs. And that also meant that if you weren't like your neighbors, and I grew up in suburbs, so our family were the only Orientals. That was the term that was still used then. It sort of suggests exoticism, like you belong halfway around the world. We were the only Oriental family in the whole neighborhood. So that meant when I went off to school, we faced the 
common cruelty of childhood bullying. Teasing and taunting. Now, recess is tough for everyone, right? <laughs> right. If, if you're not the best athlete, mm -hmm. but if you're a minority, it's also different because it was just constant name calling and, and uh, you know, being, being told to go back to, to where you came from. Or sometimes people would say, wow, you, you speak English so well, mm -hmm. right? Do you eat dogs? How can you see with eyes <laughs> right. like that? Stuff like that and being challenged to, you know, kung fu and karate mm -hmm. matches. And it wasn't the easiest time. Now, I, I'm not complaining because I know that we were relatively privileged. Mm -hmm. My dad was able to take us out for a steak maybe once every couple months, mm -hmm. right? I didn't go to bed hungry at night. I grew up in a household where both parents were present. They, they were there. And, and so I also believe in the American dream. I'm just mentioning that there's an aspect of it that sometimes people are a little uncomfortable if you, if you raise it, which is that it takes work to live up to these ideals, to these aspirations that we all say we share. But it turns out that sometimes, well, human beings, you fall short. So when I was a kid, I would go home and, and tell my parents that this happened. And because they were immigrants, because they literally spoke another language, because they were so eager to, to fit in, because they had sacrificed everything for the next generation, they would say to me, try harder. Try harder to fit in. And, and sometimes now I think to myself, you know, I'm not sure that's the best advice. You should always try harder, right? Don't, don't get me wrong. You, you should apply yourself in school. You should do your best in everything. And I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my parents setting an example and setting high standards. But when you face bias, abuse, and you try harder, you're sort of demonstrating that you're willing to face the bias and the abuse and just put your head down and just keep working in the hope, a futile hope, that by proving yourself, others will accept you. When it's not that you have to prove yourself, because it's not your problem, it's other people's prejudice, mm -hmm. right? And I share this because that, that's why I'm glad to be at Queens College, in the borough of Queens, in New York City, when we now have come around to recognizing Whatever your ethnicity, whatever your faith, whatever food you eat, whatever your grandfather's station in life, if you believe in American ideals, in, in the principles that bind together this nation, if you're willing to work hard, you can achieve. And you don't have to put up with abuse and bias and just say, I'm going to work harder and prove myself. You can say, no, wait a minute. That's not right there, what you're doing. So when I was a kid growing up, the, the truth is I was, uh, I'm ashamed to admit this now, I was embarrassed of my parents. Now, you know, every teenager is embarrassed of their parents, right? But when you don't fit in like that, the message that you get every day, and these are microaggressions, in isolation, just any one of these incidents, it's nothing. But you add it up when you're always the butt of the joke. It really, that means a lot. You know, um, when I was a kid back then, teachers would say, just reply, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't so sure about that even as a kid. Uh, I'll explain why. The words led to the sticks and stones, right? right? <laughs> so the words were fighting words. They incited mm -hmm. actual violence. I mean, we're not talking about just name calling. We're talking about, it starts with name calling, then someone spits on you, then, mm -hmm. then they, they shove you to the ground. And we saw during the pandemic, the people who were stabbed, shot, told, you're making us sick, this is your fault. Mm -hmm. Then go back to where you came from, and then all those racial slurs and, and then attacks. So the words, they, they mean something. Right? The words are how people get riled up. But the words themselves pack their own punch. You know, when you're a kid, when you're a kid, you can endure a high fever. 
you can fly off a swing set, knock your teeth out, break a bone, right? Kids bounce back. They're, they're, they're up like that, right? An adult gets a high fever like that. Wow, you know, that's dangerous. they got to go to the ER, right? Um, but when you're a kid, you recover from all that. But the, the, the trauma, people would say, oh, lighten up, come on. It's just a joke. You know, have a sense of humor. Don't be politically correct. That's what they would say now. Uh, you know, don't be woke, right? But I think it's important to understand how much this affects people because the message all the time is you don't belong here. It's not just you. You're kith and kin. None of you belong here. You're, you're dirt. You're nobody, right? We don't want your kind around here. And so I didn't quite understand why this was happening because as a kid, I never talked about any of this, this stuff. I didn't know the language of civil rights. I was just a kid. My parents didn't speak the language of civil rights. They literally spoke another language. But I figured I was different because my parents were different, right? And I knew when we watched TV, sometimes they didn't laugh at the joke. Like they, they didn't right. get the joke or they laughed at the wrong time. Or, you know, um, if there was a dispute with the bank, they'd need mm -hmm. my help as an interpreter in their awkward role reversal. They did eat funny food, mm -hmm. right? My dad was always trying to get me to eat some chicken feet, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> it's funny, my mom, um, when I was a kid, chicken feet was actually my favorite. But then That's it's great. funny, like, when, it's good for you. Yeah, right? But like when you're talking about a lot of this stuff, I'm, I'm really recalling a lot of my own experiences as well. And I know we have a gap between when we went to like, you know, elementary school, middle school, etc. But I had like a similar type of thing as well, where in my opinion, I feel like um, as an Asian American as well, you have that model minority myth. And then you right. also have the, the microaggressions. So like even for me and my family, I had like four career choices where it was doctor, lawyer, engineer, or like black sheep. So it's like pick your poison type <laughs> yeah, of thing, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're, you're right because people sometimes say, mm. you Asians, you're all smart, hardworking, <laughs> right. successful. W would you come over here and help me fix my computer? I always want to go over and erase their hard drive. Yeah. Right? Uh, because this image. Yeah. Sounds like a compliment, mm -hmm. but it but it's not. This image, um, first of all, there are crazy rich Asians, like mm -hmm. in the movie, right? There, there are folks that made a lot of money, good for them. And there are also folks started with nothing, mm. right? But they, you know, there's that raise yourself up by your own bootstraps mm. uh, uh, ethos, right? Some people have done that. I applaud them. Mm -hmm. But this idea that all Asians are crazy rich Asians, it's, it's dangerous. Here's mm -hmm. why. Because if you look, if you look at the, the reality, mm. okay, what you see is that Asian immigrants come in two different categories. Mm -hmm. So there are transnational elite, wealthy people, people with actual money, mm -hmm. or what they call human capital. They, they have an MD. Right. They have a PhD. Or they're coming, as my parents did, on scholarships as students to get that MD or PhD, right? right? It's brain drain, right? They did really well mm -hmm. wherever it is they're coming from. And they're coming here and they have a skill set that the mm -hmm. U.S. is going to invest in. There's another flow, though, that we don't really talk about. People who are undocumented. Right. People who are uh, the rideshare drivers. Mm -hmm. They're the waiter or waitress at the all-you-can-eat seafood buffet, mm -hmm. right? They're just getting by. But what happens is, because we're all focused on the first group, mm -hmm. folks who are well-to-do, we ignore the second group, right? right? We think they, they just don't exist because everyone looks and they deny that there's any problem. Oh, mm -hmm. come on, you Asians, right, we all know right. you're doing well. What kind of issues have you got? Plus, you're doing better than you would be back in your homeland, mm -hmm. as if we weren't born here, those of us who were born here. Or as if to say, you just got to put up with the abuse because you should be grateful. You're a guest. And mm -hmm. It's really rude to your hosts if you ever mention anything like this. But the mono-minority myth also generates its own racial resentment and bias mm -hmm. because people say, wait a minute, how right. come all the valedictorians, the whole top ten, mm -hmm. all the folks winning scholarships, the, the spelling bees, they're all Asian. 
What happened right. to the real Americans? There's been an invasion. They're taking over, mm -hmm. right? And there's historically this whole notion of yellow peril and, mm -hmm. and Fu Manchu trying to conquer the universe. And, and mm -hmm. it's a longstanding theme, the rise of the East, the decline of the West. And mm -hmm. which side are you on if you're of Asian descent? But the mono-minority myth also does something to Asian Americans. What you're talking about, it says, there are only certain things you can do. Mm. And if you're not the rocket scientist, whiz kid, genius, mm -hmm. you're worthless, right? You have to be super successful and mm -hmm. only in these fields. You can't be an artist, an athlete, a rebel. You can't mm -hmm. just be an ordinary human being because that's not how Asian Americans are supposed mm -hmm. to be, right? And every aspect of this myth, good at math and science, mm. can be flipped on its head. Only good at math and science. Yeah. No, <laughs> no personality, no leadership skills. Mm -hmm. right? Think about the, the child prodigy pianist or violinist, mm -hmm. right? They're seven years old, they, they can play Carnegie Hall. What do the critics say? Technically perfect, mm. just a single note, but no character, no soul, mm -hmm. right? So their skills held against them. They're too good, right? Right. right? They, trying to make it seem like, oh, it's unnatural or robotic right. in a sense. Exactly. They're automatons. Mm. They're, that's not. That's not how real human beings. <laughs> right. Right. Behave because. It, it, but it's it. The crazy thing is, it's a way of saying you're too good. Mm -hmm. You don't know your place. But the last aspect of the model minority myth we have to watch out for is sometimes. It's not even very subtle. It's just a way to say to people who are black or brown. Mm -hmm the Asians they made it why can't you right yeah using an inappropriate comparison to put down other folks using Asian Americans sort of uh, as, a, as a pawn mm -hmm. because if you're neither black nor white people don't quite know how you fit in you yeah. know because we still talk about race in mostly black and white terms mm -hmm. um, so all of that was part of my childhood but mm -hmm. I didn't know I didn't know because when you're a kid you just you want to ride your bicycle around the block, right? right? You just want to be a kid. It wasn't until later that I I realized all of these dynamics that were at work mm -hmm. that, that I didn't know about. And partly that's what we need to change mm -hmm. by having teachers who are more sensitive to these issues, mm -hmm. teachers who are role models, teachers who, who had experienced themselves going through all this. Mm -hmm. Because we can do better, and we are doing better mm -hmm. by helping folks see that we say one thing, mm -hmm. yet if you look at patterns of behavior, it doesn't quite match what we say is the social contract that, mm. that we have. You know, like... I, it was funny. Um, we were talking right before this. You were like, oh, I don't know if we're going to have enough content for 58 minutes. I'll be real with you. Just with the model minority myth alone, <laughs> we probably have like a three-hour PBS special. You know, Maybe I should hit them up. But um, I feel like you had a perfect segue into the next question, which I had, which is I'd be remiss if I didn't like try to mention New York City Men Teach because you're actually the first CUNY president that I've interviewed that actually has a New York City Men Teach chapter at their campus. And so I want to ask you, with this New York City Men Teach chapter being on your campus, can you speak? as to why a program like New York City Men Teach is needed at Queens College? It, it is so important. It is so important because, you know, there are folks who study this kind of thing. Mm. And there's a, there's a difference. This isn't my opinion. It's not a hypothesis. It's not, I'm not speculating. There are people who look at different classrooms, different teachers, mm -hmm. and then learning outcomes. How, how the kids do on tests, what, what happens to them. And it matters. Mm -hmm. It matters to have a role model. And it turns out that for almost all of us, having someone who looks sort of like us, mm -hmm. they don't have to look exactly like us. I hope they don't look exactly yeah. like me. That's all right. But just someone who you can, you can see yourself doing that mm. someone in a position of authority mm. and so when you look at students of color kids and how do they do when there's a, a teacher mm. who's similar doesn't have to be the same but similar 
they do better. Not in every case, but on average, in the aggregate, when, when you sort it out all out, the data actually shows this makes mm. a difference. So if you want to improve student learning outcomes, mm -hmm. if you want kids to get better educated, one of the best ways to do it is to put a role model at the front of the classroom. Mm. And to put someone who has thought about these issues, who's had some training, who, who isn't just a teacher, mm. and being a teacher, that's the highest calling you, you could imagine, mm. but who is a teacher with sensitivity to these issues, to where their students are coming from, what the lived experience of, of the students is. You know, I was reading in, in the news, mm -hmm. there's a judge down in Tennessee who, uh, she's about to step down, she happens to be white, and turns out for 20 years mm. in the juvenile delinquency system that they have there, and they, they did a whole study about this. Uh, a newspaper looked at it. She's been locking up mm. young African-American kids at a rate that's something like 10 times. Like the national average. What, yeah, in the, in the state, what mm. the other counties are doing. And she says it's, it's for the public safety. But when you go and, and look at it, you realize, wow, there is something going on here right. that is not right. This is someone as a judge in a position of authority mm. in the legal system when when she sees someone who's young and black and not not perfect mm -hmm. right i mean maybe they did a little something mm -hmm. they, they broke a rule but instead of giving them another chance instead of treating them the way she would treat a kid who's white who's done the same thing mm -hmm. she throws the book at him and locks him up so they did this whole study now someone who has had an experience themselves mm. where they face that sort of bias they're going to behave differently when they should behave differently when they're given a position of power mm. so it doesn't matter what role you're looking at but in the classroom especially with teachers because mm. they're visible to the students hours every day even more than the students parents are mm -hmm. because they have both the formal role of teaching and the informal role everything that goes along with it that's just part of being an adult mm -hmm. with three dozen kids because even if they're not teaching anything they're mm -hmm. teaching because the, the kids are watching how do they behave how, how do they carry themselves and so to to have a program that helps to promote and support mm -hmm. male teachers, that helps to support men of color being in the front of the classroom, that is going to make a difference for so many of these kids who, if, if, they, if we didn't have the program, mm -hmm. if they didn't encounter teachers like this, they might never be exposed mm -hmm. to someone who looks like them who has that position of authority. So um, we're, we're just honored to, to have this program because, you know, the thing is, as a college president, I realize I give speeches, mm -hmm. I talk about things, I spend my whole day talking about things <laughs> as I'm talking about with you. Yeah. But our students now, they, they have a great word, mm. performative, right? Mm meaning it's hypocrisy you're just talking mm. you're just it's just a speech you're just reading a script mm -hmm. and you know that it's important to say oh well you know we, we support this we're opposed to that mm -hmm. but what actual resources will you put into it so to have this program which actually produces graduates who then go on mm -hmm. to influence all of these students in the New York City public schools that shows this is not performative, this is real, this is tangible, right. it generates results. And when, when you look at all these patterns, you, you realize we have made progress, but there's still problems that remain mm -hmm. in the schools that we need to address. And just rhetoric won't fix it. You know, I'll, I'll take you all the way back to um, when the US Supreme Court 
decided Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. Mm -hmm. So I, I happen to be trained as a lawyer. So I, I've studied this case. I, I used to, to teach about this case. There was a crucial aspect of, about this case. So mm -hmm. before Brown versus Board, racial segregation was normal. Mm -hmm. It was legal. It was constitutional. And it was very real. It was what uh, lawyers have a term for. It's called de jure. Ah, uh, yeah. You're bringing me Racial back segregation. to like one of my high school programs yeah. where um, I used to learn about de jure. What was it like? Facto segregation yeah, yeah, and, and all de facto. that. Stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> so de jure is where the law actually uh -huh. says we're gonna have separate classrooms, mm -hmm. separate schools, separate drinking fountains, mm -hmm. swimming pools, seats on the bus where the law actually says you must do it this way. Mm -hmm. De facto is where the law doesn't say it, but it turns out that way. Well, right. before 1954, de jure legal segregation, mm -hmm. and people today would find it, I think, hard to believe that it was written in mm -hmm. the law. So if you went and looked up in the statute books, you would, you would see it's actually right. all spelled out there in the southern states that, that had these mm -hmm. practices. But, but the North is not innocent. In northern states, even if it wasn't spelled out, that's what was being done. Right, it was still and, de facto in yeah, a sense. exactly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was just by practice. Mm -hmm. It was informal, you know, it was kind of under the table, that sort of thing. Right. Well, in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court said, mm -hmm. that's not right. They said under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, mm -hmm which guarantees equal protection of the laws, you can't have separate but equal. That was the phrase. And, mm. and it was separate, but it was not equal. Um, because if you went and looked, every place where there was a white school and a black school, you would find white school was in a better neighborhood, mm -hmm. had more resources, the teachers were paid more, they had textbooks that were brand new. Black school, everything was falling apart. They got mm. the hand-me-down textbooks, et cetera. It was not equal at all. Okay. But even if it were equal, mm -hmm. just the separation was symbolic. It said one of these is better than the other because right. it's never just separate. It's never just two. You, you, it didn't matter whether you were white or black or an Asian immigrant. If you were walking around, you would realize, okay, the, the better schools are the mm -hmm. white schools, just period. Right? Okay, so in 1954, U.S. Supreme Court said, we're striking that down. It's not constitutional. You, you can't keep doing it this mm -hmm. way. And the evidence they relied on, the people forget that there, there were expert witnesses mm. in these cases. Um, there were a husband and wife team of psychologists. Right? What, what they did, did a whole series of experiments to just show how devastating the effect of racial segregation mm -hmm. was on kids, young kids. They did this famous series of, of tests, of experiments with dolls. Mm. And what they did was they went to um, both white children and black children. Okay? But the shocking part is when they went to black children, okay, black girls, and, and they, they showed them a white doll and a black doll and said, mm -hmm. which doll is the pretty one? Which, which doll do you, do you want to play with? Right. Which, which doll do you prefer? Mm. Now, not in every case, but enough that there was a pattern. It became clear right. that even if you were black, because of how pervasive, how overwhelming these messages were, mm -hmm. you thought of the white doll as better, as prettier, mm -hmm. as the one you wanted to play with, as what was preferred. And you thought of the doll that was black that looked like mm -hmm. you as, that's not Good. You know what's crazy? Like, I, and I have this anecdote, and I, I've told this story a handful of times, but I didn't realize that part of the Brown versus um, Board of Ed case. I didn't realize they actually had um, a te like the husband wife psychologist type thing, because for me, when I was in kindergarten, it was a similar scenario, but it was with books. I had brown bear, I had polar bear, and so we always had to say the pledge of allegiance um, in kindergarten. Now I would always show up to class, and the polar bear book would be taken. There's only one copy, so I always had to get brown bear. Now I was on like this mad hunt, like I need to get polar bear. I need it. Mm -hmm. Now one day I get there early. The kid who usually gets polar bear, he would always hog it. I would, he would never share whatever, mm -hmm. right? I finally got the polar bear book, and now I'm about to read it. I wasn't able to read it because we had to say the pledge. So I'm standing on the book, so he doesn't take it. You know, he yoinks it, 
from right. underneath me and then gives me the brown bear book. Yeah. It wasn't until then a little bit later that I finally got the polar bear book because that kid was absent that day. And I realized that now, and even during that point when I was reading the polar bear book, it was the same exact book as the brown bear. Mm-hmm. The words were the same. They did the same things. The end was the same. The beginning was the same. The only, the only thing different was the colors of the bears and you know the, like, the settings that they're at. But then as I got older, I started to realize, I'm like, why was I so hell-bent? on getting yeah. that polar bear book right. the brown bear book was the same exact thing and if anything like the brown bear book kind of like related a little bit more to me but it's funny you mentioned that because again that's what i was instantly brought back to and they had that in that case like almost 70 years ago so it, it kind of stood the test of time <laughs> and it's crazy this is on the web so you can mm. find it and do it for yourself there's something called the implicit association test mm. yeah. we know this concept now but when I was a kid, the people who came up with this idea hadn't mm-hmm. even come up with it yet. It existed, but people didn't recognize it. Mm-hmm. Unconscious bias, right. or what they sometimes call implicit bias. That's where you say one thing. Mm-hmm. We're all equal. I'm not prejudiced. Mm-hmm. Bias is wrong. But then, even if unconsciously, right? So maybe you're well-meaning, mm-hmm. right? You're not a bigot. Right? You want to do what's right. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, there's something in the back of your head mm-hmm. right, rattling around. And this is true for me. It's true for mm-hmm. all of us. We're, we're all prejudiced in some way. Right? We just picked it up. Right? Some people argue maybe it's hardwired. In mm-hmm. areas, right? But this implicit association test, what, what they do. And, and there are all sorts of ways to, to do this. But they, mm-hmm. they have things like little word games. Right. Like when you say... Um, you know, match up these like words. The association. Good, good and yeah. bad, black and white, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Good pairs with white, bad pairs with black, mm-hmm. right? And they mess with you, okay, by trying to do some things where the the pairs don't match the way they're mm-hmm. supposed to, right? The way you expect them to. And they, they test things like reaction time and, right. and so on and so forth. And what they show is, you know what? We all have this inside us. And that's not an excuse. It just means we need to be more aware of this, mm-hmm. that there's something going on that is beneath the surface that we can't quite control, but there are techniques, there are methods that you mm-hmm. can use that over time will nudge people and it will alter their behavior, change their perceptions. One of them is role models. Right. That's why having teachers who mm-hmm. are role models will help because the more you're exposed to images that are different, the, mm-hmm. the more you're exposed as an equal to, to people who, they don't conform to the stereotype that you've picked up, the more that changes mm-hmm. how you perceive the world and then in turn your behavior. So what's important to realize for all of us is we can change. Mm-hmm. Individuals can change. Society can change. But it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen magically. It doesn't mm-hmm. happen automatically. It doesn't just happen because I pledge to change, mm-hmm. right? It's... Uh, it's just like working out or, or being in good shape. A, a few years ago, I, I decided that you know, I, I'd been a stereotypical nerdy kid, <laughs> right. Right? S- sedentary, D- didn't work out or anything mm-hmm. like that. You know, but I, I was getting older and I realized, geez, you know, if, if, I, if I don't get off the couch and, mm-hmm. and do something, I'm going to have a heart attack. So I started to, to run. Mm-hmm. What I realized is you have to keep at it because right. as soon as you take a few days off, you can you, you can measure it on your watch these days. Mm-hmm. You see your performance starts to slide, right? And and we we know that uh, about physical fitness, mm-hmm. you you can't slack off, mm-hmm. and you can't just pledge, "Hey, I'm going to be in good shape," right? You actually have to exert yourself. Mm-hmm. You have to watch what you eat. You 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 have, you have to put effort into it. Mm-hmm. It has to be deliberate because. If you're not thinking about it, you're going to eat too many French fries, or at least yeah. I am, and then you know you're going to wake up and mm-hmm. you're going to say, "Geez, these pants are tight, mm. right?" Well, of course they are because y- y- you didn't put in the effort, mm. and we know that. Just 
adult human beings know this about most of life that mm. things don't happen magically or automatically that they require a plan they require discipline they require follow through for some reason though when it comes to issues about race mm. and civil rights we're a little uncomfortable we want it to be magic we want it to right. be automatic we want it to be isn't it enough that mm -hmm. we say discrimination is wrong all right mm. we've said it we're done right <laughs> yeah except we've got all this history we've got mm -hmm everything that's gone before us that's created this world that we live in where there are disparities and what is important to me about the programs that we have is this is all about evidence and mm -hmm. facts this is not about my opinion or your opinion we can show and 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 the people who have created these programs are really thoughtful. Mm -hmm. they, they're constantly trying to improve them. So they're always looking at what can we tweak that, that will make this better. But what you can show when, when you look at the results mm -hmm. is it matters. It matters if you can put teachers into the classroom with the students mm -hmm. so that the students identify with the teacher and look up to the teacher. You know, um, and do I know exactly what's going on in a five-year-old's head? No, I, I don't. Probably even the people who say this couldn't tell you exactly mm -hmm. what's going on. But you, you take enough examples of this and you mm -hmm. measure it and you can, you can say, look, you have whatever percentage improvement on mm -hmm. test scores, um, on persistence, on graduation rates, when you compare these two classrooms. Mm -hmm. And... So if we want to bring about this type of change, this mm -hmm. is how we do it. And it's, it's not just that it's the right thing to do, right? I'm an idealist. We should do mm -hmm. what is the right thing to do. But even if you didn't care one bit about what is the right thing to do, when you look at this, when you look at the evidence, it's compelling. You would say, right. look, um, you know, I'm, uh, someone might say, I'm not big on civil rights. I would say, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. just, just take a look at what happens. You want to reduce crime. Mm -hmm. You want more civic engagement. You want better voter turnout. You, you want your neighbors to have better job opportunities mm -hmm. and, and bring up the whole neighborhood. Here's one thing we can do. Right. It's not that big. It's, it's, it's a small thing in some sense, right? It doesn't take a huge investment. Mm -hmm. It requires nudging a few folks and supporting them as they pursue education as a career and 10 years from now mm. you will see a difference on all of these uh, metrics that that you care about mm. that concern the quality of life mm. you know and this is gonna be a little side note but you need to have like an ASMR or like a podcast of your own because at this point, like I'm listening to you talk, I'm like, man, you have a very soothing voice. I'm about to hit you up. Like, can you give me some lessons so I could yeah. refine my skills? But um, thank you for that wonderful answer. And I want to switch gears and ask you, how has it been being the president of Queens College? And it's going to be like a two part question. How has it been being the president of Queens College? And what has been your biggest challenges and your proudest accomplishments during your tenure here thus far? Right. So, you know, I didn't set out to be a college president. Mm. That's sort of a strange thing to say because I am a college president. Right. I wanted to be the president of Queens College mm. here specifically. I say to folks, this is my dream job. This is the job that I'd like to have, knock on wood if people will have me, mm -hmm. until I retire. And the reason is because of the diversity of the mm. borough. The whole world is here. Doesn't matter what your ethnicity, what your faith, or a better way to put it is, it matters to you and you'll be respected for whatever your ethnicity or faith mm. is. You will have a place, you'll be a New Yorker, and there are populations here you wouldn't find anywhere. The Indo-Caribbean population, mm. for example. Uh, we have folks who are refugees, we have every type of combination you can imagine and and groups within groups that they just don't exist even mm. uh, in a nation of of immigrants of newcomers uh, 
one example is on our campus, we have probably the largest enrollment of any American institution of higher education of mm. Bukharian Jews. Mm. So that's a specific population that came from Central Asia after the fall of the Soviet Union mm. and settled mostly in Queens, in mm. Forest Hills, Rico Park, uh, and now represents a substantial portion of our population. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So uh, I believe in what we're doing. And, you know, I never knock any other institution of higher education, mm. okay? But but I'll just say something that's just fact. Mm. There are some places to go to college that's gonna cost you $80,000 for one year. Mm. 80,000, all right, for one year. So if if you're spending four years, it's 320,000 mm. you or your parents will have to pay. And some of these places, they skimp on, uh, scholarships right, right. You take out loans uh, but let's be clear about this three hundred twenty thousand dollars that's a huge loan mm -hmm. so at my age in my mid-50s mm -hmm. i have friends who are just now finishing paying off their students yeah, can, that's crazy. Can, can, yeah can you imagine that? they've been yeah. paying a thousand bucks two thousand even three thousand bucks a month payment. for for their whole yeah. lives until they get to their 50s mm. um there's a, a movie, I'm told it was Barack Obama's favorite movie mm. last year. It's called uh, Emily the Criminal. Mm. Um, it, it, and this won't ruin the movie for you. It, mm -hmm. It's a, about a young woman who becomes a criminal. Mm -hmm. In the first five minutes, you learn why she has to be a criminal. Uh, I bet you money she, student debt. <laughs> student debt. She can't yeah. pay her student loans. Uh -huh. She has to turn to a life of crime. Mm -hmm. But that setup is so relatable, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Because it, it, it's just so realistic. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I was a professor, and I was a professor at Howard University, mm -hmm. which is the nation's leading historically black institution of higher education, mm -hmm. as a mission. And I thought I would be a professor for my whole life, mm -hmm. but I was asked to be a trustee of another unique institution, Gallaudet University. Mm -hmm. That's a school for the deaf and hard of hearing. Uh -huh. It's the only one in the entire world, it's hmm. fully bilingual, American Sign Language, and English. That's crazy. What state is it's that It's in, in Washington, D.C. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're being filmed, so mm -hmm. I know a little bit of sign language. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. ASL. Right. Uh -huh. uh, that I picked up from about a decade of service there. Mm -hmm. And I saw there, speaking of role models, the, the president, a fellow named I. King Jordan, mm -hmm. he was born hearing, but he was in a motorcycle accident, almost died, oh. and lost all of his hearing. And he was amazing. Mm -hmm. His motto was, the deaf can do everything except hear. Yeah. And, and what he did was he, he transformed the institution mm -hmm. and transformed people's lives. Because before the ADA, before cochlear implants, if mm -hmm. you were deaf, no matter how talented you were, no matter how smart, no matter how work, hard working or how dedicated, mm -hmm. there just wasn't opportunity for you in higher education even if you could get in mm -hmm. to an institution, they wouldn't offer interpreters. So unless you mm. were rich, you, know, you, you wouldn't be able to, to go. So I, I saw there that if you were a leader dedicated to a mission and if the institution mm. were committed, what you could do, you could help not just individuals, which is important, you could help their families, you could help whole communities. Mm. So that is what motivated me. And then along the way, a, a few years back, I had this health issue, mm -hmm. serious health issue. I had to go through chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not unique, I, I won't dwell on this, but for a lot of folks, you go through something like that and it just changes your priorities. Mm -hmm. You think to yourself, all right, stuff I used to care about or think I cared about, mm -hmm. eh, not so important. I, I can actually, what really matters in life is mm -hmm. a different set of things. And so I pursued this opportunity here at Queens College mm -hmm. because, um, because I, I believe in what we're doing, because mm -hmm. of the diversity of the world's borough, because higher education is the engine of the American dream, mm -hmm. and, and we are still committed, not charging people $80,000 a year, charging mm -hmm. them one-tenth of that, and almost half our students pay nothing mm -hmm. thanks to the generosity of the state and the city. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep doing that because that's what we were founded mm -hmm. to do. And they they go on to be teachers. They, mm -hmm. they go on 
to give back. They, they pay it forward, mm-hmm. is, is the phrase. Um, so it's been a crazy time. I mm-hmm. started this job during the pandemic, and we've almost sort of forgotten. You know, our memories are receding of yeah. what that was like. Um, but that, that was not easy. Mm-hmm. And then as we were coming out of the pandemic, it became even harder because people had every single view that you could imagine right. about how quickly you should open, whether you should require vaccinations mm-hmm. and masks to, to just everything. And, mm-hmm. and the world is it's divided. It's anxious. Yeah. You know, this is a moment in human history where it feels like there's a reckoning, mm-hmm. right? Because... We had the pandemic. That's a plague, right? We we, we have uh, plagues of locusts, different places, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, depending on your faith, there are all these signs of mm-hmm. right, the, these are the end like doomsday, times. so to speak. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> and there's the reality of climate change, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so it's been a crazy time, mm-hmm. but I I still believe in what we're doing because we're needed now mm-hmm. more than ever. So many of our students. Mm-hmm come from homes where they're middle class mm. they, they have a house mm-hmm. but then with the pandemic because one or both of the parents work in right. jobs where they're laid off let's say they work at one of the airports mm-hmm. right we got two airports within 15 minutes a year mm-hmm. I actually met one of our scholarship students mm-hmm. she explained her father worked for an airline pandemic started he was laid off right. that family which it was doing fine before. Mm-hmm. Then they were worried they would be homeless. Mm-hmm. She had to take advantage of our food pantry, mm-hmm. right? And she was lucky. She was a good student. She mm-hmm. got a scholarship. But if it weren't for that, she wouldn't have been able to continue. Mm-hmm. That's a typical story for us. Right. So many of our students are, are like that. Or they they, they got to work a job. Or maybe something like the pandemic happens. Mm-hmm. they got to work two jobs and then they don't have enough time to dedicate to, to their studies. Mm-hmm. So now we're, we're rebuilding. Mm-hmm. And during the pandemic, we all said, when, when this is over, let's, let's improve. Let's mm-hmm. do things better than we were doing before. So I'm determined now to, to do that. What, what did we do? We, we did a whole strategic plan. We had about 1,100 people participating in all these virtual town halls. Mm-hmm. People said to me, this is crazy and messy. It, it was, but it was more mm-hmm. democratic because democracy is crazy mm-hmm. and, and messy. Uh, but we came up with a plan. It's not my vision. It's a shared vision, and it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm-hmm. It's about giving people more than one skill set. Mm-hmm. So I really believe it's important for people to have two skills mm-hmm. at least because if you only do one thing you'll be obsolete it's like putting all your eggs in one basket yeah. so to speak you have to be able mm-hmm. to adapt and we know that with just the constant change mm-hmm. around us you know um whoever was the finest saddle maker in the nation <laughs> when the on- automobile came along right that was it for the saddle maker right mm-hmm. maybe they'd have 20 years but their children would not inherit a business right. and continue to make saddles Whoever is the best engineer working on internal combustion engines, mm-hmm. clearly they're doomed, right? right? Because now you need to be an engineer who works on battery technology, mm-hmm. right? But eventually batteries will be superseded by hydrogen fuel cells or what, whatever else. The point is you have to be able to adapt. Mm. So we started an art school and a business school. It's mm. no accident we did both these at the same time. I mm. want every art student to take a business class so that they can be an entrepreneur, oh. right? So that they mm-hmm. can someday run a dance company or theater. And I want right, every right. business school student to take an art class mm-hmm. so they're well-rounded, so so they, they have a full experience as mm. a student. And, you know, many of our, our students, uh, I have this conversation again and again and again with either the student or their, their parents. And I know mm-hmm. this from my own family it's especially true if the parents are newcomers, but it's also true mm. if the parents didn't have an opportunity to go to college and, mm. and, and their child is the first among all the cousins. These are communities that are very practical. So mm-hmm. kid right. comes here, kid uh, is told by their, their parents, mm-hmm. study accounting. Mm-hmm. They take an accounting class. They say, 
I can't do this. Mm-hmm. They, they get a C minus. They say, I cannot, for the rest of my life, right. do this, you know. Then they take uh, an art class. Mm-hmm. They get an A plus. They take an anthropology class. Mm-hmm. They say, wow, it's fantastic. This is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and they go back to the parents and they say that. And the parents say, what? <laughs> Drop out right now. Yeah. Anthropology? <laughs> what is that? There are right. no jobs in that field. I don't even know what that is. Mm-hmm. Right. So what I want to say to them, it's okay. Come here. Come to this institution where we have a business and liberal arts program. Mm-hmm. Come to this institution where you can be a double major. Come here and take classes in the art school and the business school mm-hmm. because I don't want you to graduate and not be able to pay rent. Right. <laughs> but I also don't want you to graduate, enter a profession you don't care about, mm-hmm. wake up when you're 40 and say, oh, gee, I, I wish I could do this all over again. Yeah. I want you to be able to do both. This takes me back to teachers. Mm-hmm. Does it take me back to teachers? We've got a great education school here. Mm-hmm. And the thing about teachers is they're all automatically double majors. Mm-hmm. Even if they're not literally double majors, they all study English or history or chemistry or physics mm-hmm. on the one hand. Then they study pedagogy. How do you teach right. it? How do you transmit this knowledge? How do you impart skills mm-hmm. to to the next generation? So. Every teacher automatically is learning uh, along two different tracks, and that's what I hope every student will do. So in a way, the the education school students, the teachers, Mm -hmm. they they represent the the best of what Queens College is all about. And you know, um, I got two anecdotes before. You see, like I'm looking at the time too, because I'm like, oh, gotta make sure the timer right. We got like only, I think, what, seven, eight minutes left. Uh-huh. And I'm like, all the questions I had planned, I, I know this happens with guests that I'm like very enthused about. I have like a list of questions. We didn't even get to like half of them. <laughs> all right. Just but, have me back sometime. Oh, listen, I'm 100% down with that. <laughs> but um, the two anecdotes, because you're talking about um, Queens College and the tuition costs compared to private universities. So the two anecdotes I have with that is one, I had two teachers in high school. One went to private universities all throughout their collegiate experience and grad school experience. One went through CUNY throughout. Actually, Queens College is where he went for mm. his bachelor's and his master's. And they both ended up becoming assistant principal at other schools. So they're both in the same position. And when we were in high school, they would always tell us, the one that went to the private schools, don't go to the private schools. Like, I'm in my 40s, 50s, still paying off my loans, but I'm in the same position as and the other teacher who went to CUNY. That was his best friend. Yeah. So they were best friends, but they both had a different trajectory right. in terms of the private versus public. And then they still came back to public institutions anyway. Right. The, on the other hand, though, the one who didn't go through all that now you know, doesn't have any student debt chilling, right. relax. Right. And then the anecdote brought me back to was for me, um, when I got into college, I had a couple of choices. So like my family, they were, they were like, go to this private university. It was about the prestige. It was about the name. And I was like, well, they're only giving me like 50%. So I'm going to have to shell out the other 50. And then of course, over time, it's going to dwindle. Like you got to be pragmatic about it. But they're like, no, 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 go, go. It's okay. And I was going to accept it. Then I thought to myself, I'm like, I don't want this. And I ended up going to CCNY, that was my alma mater. But the crazy thing is, I graduated debt free, but I was essentially paid by them with the scholarship opportunities, FAFSA, et cetera. But then that lump sum that I was able to then receive from CUNY is what fueled the seed fund, so to speak, for my first business that I started during the pandemic. Now that wouldn't have been successful had I not gone to the public institutions. Because even if I did go to a private institute, I wouldn't have funding. And during the pandemic, nobody would have given me funding anyway. So then it's funny you mention that because when I really look at it, that's why for me personally as well, I'm very committed to the public institutions because I've noticed that they have a lot to give. You just got to know where to look, so to speak. I feel like a lot of people have a negative conception sometimes where they're just like, oh, well, it's not really going to amount to much or X, Y, and Z. But in reality, uh, even my career right now, like I, w- I was part of New York City Men Teach in 2017, worked there as a college assistant, and then eventually, after um, the pandemic was over, I hit somebody up. I'm like, "Yo, you got a job for me at the DOE?" And all was said and done, and that's it. So I really feel like the public system. If you really are enthused about it, you can really not only give a lot, but you know, give back to the institution that created a lot. Uh, you you've got it exactly <laughs> spot on. You know, the the greatest enemy of future Frank is not any of my rivals. The Mm. greatest enemy of future Frank is present day Frank Mm. who's going to make a stupid decision that in a year I'm going to have to deal with the consequences. (laughs) Ask anyone Mm -hmm. who 
is paying twenty five hundred dollars a month mm-hmm. for their student debt if they enjoy <laughs> paying yeah. that amount and doing it every month mm-hmm. and knowing they're going to have to do that for a decade or mm-hmm. two decades or three decades. There's nobody who's going to say to you, yeah, yay, <laughs> the student debt's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they are all very sad people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's avoidable. Look, you know, if, if you're wealthy, mm-hmm. if you've got a 100% scholarship, go for it, you know? Fine, yeah. You know? <laughs> That's your business, all right? Um, And the other thing is, you know, we're not much of a party school. But Mm -hmm. here's the deal. You know, $80,000 a year, that's... That's an expensive party. (laughs) Yeah, steep price to play beer pong, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We can offer you something that I think when future you wakes up Mm -hmm. in 10 years, they're going to say, that was a pretty good investment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like that's the perfect send off to wrap up the episode. Uh, before we do wrap up, I do want to give you the chance to shout out any, um, you know, any sponsors, people, you know, partnerships. That's your camera right there. Feel free to, you know, shout out anyone that you want. All right. Great. Come to Queens College. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you in the fall. There you go. And there you guys have it. That was President Frank Wu. I appreciate you for coming on and uh, doing this interview with us. Honestly, there's so many topics where I'm just like, damn, I, I want like a standalone content for this, a standalone content for that. And my head's like racing and I'm just like, you know what? No, let, let me focus on getting the episode done and then I'll hit Frank and bother him. Like, yo, can we film some more? All right. <laughs> but with that being said, that does wrap up season two, episode six of Education in Color. Thank you once again for joining us and we'll see you guys next time for episode seven. Take care. Take care.